So let's start. This is a, a ad hoc. As for forum, as you can see, it's being recorded for a webinar. So no Pala Brothers, please. Yeah. But um, this is yeah put together because we thought it would be good to, before everybody goes on quarantine, just to have a bit of scientific information about what's happening with coronavirus. See? I see. So what I have tried to do, this has only been done in the last 16 hours, so I can hardly say I'm an expert, but we've tried to find all the latest scientific stuff on coronavirus and put it together so you can see objectively what's really happening and make a better decision about whether what we're doing for quarantine is or is not justified and why. So we can discuss that at the end. So I'm just going to present what I found. This is not everything because I didn't have time to do everything. One of the things that is missing is maybe what are the studies being done with the new treatments and so on to really take it to the next level, vaccines and stuff like that. We may even expand this in the next week or so. You will see at the end we're going to stop this part when we get to the regulatory part because I think it's very interesting to know what procedures are in place for this kind of situation at the EMA and the FDA and stuff like that because that's also very interesting and relates to some projects that we do do here. So let's start. Coronavirus. So here's a, just a pastiche of some random pictures to show you where we are. Infection and so on. This one I put here, this is a very personal one. This is a picture of a statue in Perth, which was a site of an old bathing place, let's say, where the, the Swan River is. And it's a statue that they've left there. And there was a big rush on the supermarkets on the weekend. Everyone bought all the toilet paper made a joke and said these are the last two rolls left in Australia <laughs> and yesterday it's not only here yesterday I did go to the supermarket and there was very little toilet paper and very little canned tomatoes so now we know what everybody's eating for the next two weeks okay so here's a couple of just front pages of papers that announce more or less the virus and the disease. So it's important to make this distinction. The virus is actually called SARS-CoV-2, so SARS coronavirus 2. It's not called COVID-19, so you'll see that name in the newspapers and stuff, but that's the disease. The disease is called coronavirus disease 2019 okay which is caused by the virus so you can see here the diff two different papers reporting on that um, the first one started coming out already at the beginning of the year this one is from an association which gives the proper name and the nomenclature which is now agreed more or less okay so what we're talking about here is the riboviria fam uh, realm the family is the coronaviridae family this is a particular genera called the beta coronavirus so if you're looking for the levels i thought this was quite a useful picture to know exactly where you are so primates would be here and we're down on the individual level here but this the sars virus is already on the individual level here okay so this, as well as a really interesting and very useful figure, I think, from this paper, I tried to indicate the papers where possible so you can check the data that I'm giving you if you need to. So this is a really good chronogram on day by day number of cases at the very beginning of the outbreak. So what you can see here is, especially this period here, right at the end of the year, you can see some of these cases starting to be reported to the Chinese medical authorities. There's a lot of talk about this um, medical practitioner, Dr. Zhang, who I believe died of the, the disease uh, after reporting it, and there was some controversy over how he was treated in that situation. But basically, you can see here, these blue bars represent um, dates of cases by onset, so they suspect these are cases, they may have been confirmed retrospectively, but basically some pneumonia cases started coming up here. This Dr. Zhang made some alarm to the authorities. They obviously traced it very quickly to the um, market in Wuhan, and they shut it down very quickly on New Year, and then they began to identify and do everything for the virus. So you can see here the virus was identified on the 7th of January and after that you can see there's a lag of maybe about two weeks let's say between getting a diagnostic test. So then you can see this orange bar starts to come up. So this is also called a lag phase. Um, you'll see another graph which shows an effect of the lag phase. So this is obviously clinical symptoms, clinical cases and then purely diagnostic cases and obviously the WHO um, 
interventions and so on starts coming here and the shutdown and so on. So maybe here as well, what's interesting to see is you get a peak and then you get the shutdown and the peak starts going down. And that's really what the quarantine is about. I didn't have time to put the figure on because I was rushing a bit, but there's a concept here which is called flattening the curve. And that's basically what the quarantine is about. If you don't do this, this just goes up and that means more and more patients. So you try and reduce the curve. They're not trying to stop it completely, but if you do that, you'd reduce the burden on the healthcare system. And that seems to have worked in China. I think this uh, graph is also interesting. It's from the same paper. This is basically a parallel timeline chart of the SARS outbreak in 2002 and the COVID-19 outbreak now. So you can see how parallel it is, almost frighteningly so. So this is obviously winter time in China, November, December, new flu case emerging. In this case, it was in another part of China. Um, it took a lot longer for the Chinese authorities to report the case to the authorities here, and they were widely criticized for that at the time. So it's three, four months. There were already 300 cases and several deaths before it got going. And you can see things started off um, and then disappeared quite quickly. So even by the middle of the year, it was more or less stopped. And I'll show you another graph on that later, which I think is very important to also understand what's happening now. So here you can see this was reported later. Uh, sorry, detected first later and then reported earlier. So we're kind of already squeezing up this graph here. Maybe the difference, as we'll show, is this one keeps going on, okay? So this is a little bit about the virus itself. You'll recognize this whoops, from uh, another ASF forum that we did, but this is an expanded version. So this is the structure here. So this you can see it has the spike proteins that make this kind of layer. Uh, around the outside that looks like the corona, the crown, so that's why they get their name. This is a real EM of, of this SARS-CoV-2. This, this is another one from Wikipedia, probably, sadly. So this type of virus, um, it's a positive strand RNA virus, so that means you need to detect RNA for the genome. You'll see that for the testing that I mentioned a bit later. The genome size is about 30 KB which is very big for an RNA virus. And I will show you the genome and some things there. Usually you get a variable number of open reading frames, six to 11, which are the genes, let's say, and these can make multiple proteins, as you'll see. Uh, usually the transmission is from animals, so I will show you a little bit about that as well. Um, and I've already told you about the name here. So in terms of the risk to people, the coronavirus in the current uh, legislation in Europe, the Directive 2054 EC, which is about workplace safety for biological agents, that classifies this as a class two. So Laura, is she here? Yeah, she knows all about the difference between BSL, class, risk group and so on. But just for simplicity, let's call it BSL2. But what the WHO has published is that if you're propagating this virus in the lab, it's BSL-3, but if you're just doing a test, it's BSL-2, like the guideline says. So this is the genome of the coronavirus here. So obviously five prime to three prime. These are the names of some of the um, key proteins. But what you get here, as you do with most viruses, you get what's called open reading frames. So you get one here, essentially that encodes multiple what's called NSPSs, so non-structural proteins. So these are proteins that help it hijack the cell, replicate, and so on. And then you get structural proteins here, which make the spike things and you know all that kind of stuff. You also have some accessory genes spiked, uh, included in the genome at different positions as well, okay? So if you do a family tree, looking especially at this gene here, this ORF1AB, so this is obviously AB because it has all of these things. So all of these things are separate proteins within the main master gene and, and this gene here. You align all these up and you get the family tree of the SARS virus. So what you can see here is the first SARS from 2002. Here's the new SARS virus here. So it's kind of related in the same family. MERS seems to be a little bit more divergent, which is probably good because it seems to be much more pathogenic. And here are also four orange viruses, which are standard cold and flu viruses. Every year, coronavirus goes around 
And I assume this is also one of the reasons why they're a bit concerned of this, because if this enters, maybe every year it's going to come around like a common cold, for better or worse. I guess as well, there's also a risk of recombination. This MERS, as we'll see, is still active. So maybe if this and this infects the same people, that could be an interesting situation. That's probably very unlikely, but it may happen. You may have seen as well some reports in the, in the literature about pangolins. I won't even describe what they look like, but pangolin is a kind of animal from Malaysia, especially I think in, in this case. But basically they suggest, though I don't think it's been confirmed 100%, that the virus is related to the pangolin version of the virus because they might have been sold in the market. So that's one of the current hypotheses. Um, so we mentioned SARS briefly. I think we showed these graphs in NASFA forum, but it's worth bringing them out again. This is what happened in SARS. You remember we showed the beginning here. It started off in November, a few cases here, and then it was reported, and somehow they managed to stop everything by isolation and all that kind of stuff, treatment. So by the end of May, June, the same year, or within six months, that was it. There's been no reported cases since, as far as I know. So that's interesting from that level, as we'll get to the case before. I'll go through some of the other numbers as well as we get to them, but here we have about 8,000 cases of SARS, 700, 800 deaths in 37 countries. It seemed to have come from bats and palm civets. I don't even know what a palm civet is. Does anyone know what a palm civet is? I guess it might be a kind of monkey thing or something. I really don't know what it is. Um, and the receptor it uses to go into the cell is the ACE2 receptor, which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor with some other ones. And it appears that the current SARS virus actually recognizes the same, um, the same receptor. So that was already last week or something. Um, so looking at MERS, um, I presented this as well in the other ASFA forum, and this is also important. So this came much more recently, and it seems to peak every so often and then disappear, but never quite. It's always active. So it's actually still active virus in principle. This is from 2019, so the end of 2019. So it's also circulating in some countries that also have quite a lot of um, COVID-19 cases as well. So that's kind of interesting. This one came from dromedary camels. And in this case, it appears to be much more uh, lethal. 2,500 cases, nearly 900 deaths in 27 countries, which is quite high. But I'll sh again, I'll show you those numbers better in another slide. So here's this the high-end summary then. So there's three main coronaviruses that cause um, serious infections, let's say. These are the SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. So the, the, the symptoms from these are more or less all the same. You get fever, cough, and lower respiratory tract infection, and maybe you'll get um, pneumonia, for example. So for the current uh, SARS virus, you have poor clinical outcomes with older age and underlying health conditions. I'll show you the numbers there so you can see what that looks like. Um, you usually have to confirm the infection by nucleic acid testing, usually from respiratory tract samples like a throat swab or some sputum or something like that. Um, obviously, there's a risk here of confusing the same kind of infection with a common cold and other influenza. It's the season, so that's why the diagnostic is also important. And that's also probably causing a bit of chaos as well because people don't know if you've just got a cold or you've got SARS or you've got something. Um, at the moment, there's no treatment, so that's it. They're developing treatments, but there's nothing more or less you can do. I think one of the risks is if you are in the hospital with intensive care, the saturation of intensive care could increase uh, mortality rates if that gets too high. Okay, so here's a breakdown of the symptoms that you get. 90% of people have fever, so I would suggest if you start feeling a fever, you should go into isolation. If you have a runny nose, I would probably still go into isolation, but probably you haven't got SARS, because if you look here somewhere, almost never causes runny nose, which is kind of interesting. But you'll get um, a dry cough, which other people have reported, fatigue, muscle pains, and stuff like that, which are probably as a result of fever and stuff like that. Um, so they're the main symptoms that you should expect. If you have that, you should follow the procedures from your country, okay? Um, 
One of the issues I'll show again, the numbers, the severity can be very high, and that means the demand on the ICU is very high, and that containment is basically about protecting the healthcare system. Um, see if we can get one of these maps. These are being updated daily. So we can see there's plenty of different versions. So this is still from yesterday. You can see where the clusters of cases are and so on. So we're going to move in on Spain just to see where we are. So you can see Barcelona is a bit of a red spot, more than 50 cases. Well, actually, Lleida, no, it looks like. No, not even. It's in the middle of Catalonia. So there must be a camping ground there with SARS or something like that. So, But anyway, you can see the numbers here. These are being updated regularly. It's important to know that some of these cases are not always confirmed. Usually on these graphs they are, but these kind of situations, you need to be careful about what kind of data you're looking at. You, I don't think I've got the graph here, and I didn't get time to look at it, but there was a spike in cases a few weeks ago in China because they changed the reporting thing, and then they changed it back again, so it looks really weird. But that's what I mean. You have to be careful looking at this data. But at the moment, we're looking at about 120,000 confirmed cases. So I'll just jump back here. It's quite a big difference from stars and obviously this stopped and the new one is going on so I suggest that would be something to have a think about this one is obviously much less but has been going on for much longer so that's the first kind of data to start looking at this data is being published from Chinese patients this is one of the first main uh, reports coming out so just to go through the age distribution you can see here that we're mostly young people in this room, we're all in this age bracket, essentially. That doesn't mean we're immune. We could still get it very easily. So don't think you're immune and it's just old people, okay? Old people do and so on. Young people do not do to get the disease as well, but they do not seem to be as severe. But there also seems to be a slightly less cases as well in the young people. Why that is, it's hard to say, maybe the zone. Uh, the spectrum of the disease is also pretty critical. Since 5% of cases are critical, um, that's quite high because they're obviously all needing ICU and stuff like that. Severe cases as well probably need some kind of hospitalization. So that's quite big numbers, really. Uh, this is probably the number that most people will get worried about. And I'll show you some proper data on this. This is the case fatality rate, the CFR. At this stage in this paper, they estimated it to be 2.3% in China. But when you have a look at the numbers, this is where you start seeing how this interacts. So it's 2.3 across the board, but once you get over 80 years old, you have about a 15% chance of dying, which is pretty high, okay? 8% as well above 70 years of age. So that's quite alarming for parents of people in the room, basically, because if you get it, you can get really sick. Worse is 50% of critical cases have mortality. So that's 5% of cases of uh, uh, severe or critical, according to this. So that means um, of these people, 1,000 would have died, more or less, which is quite high as well. Another issue seems to be this, how easy it is to infect healthcare workers. I didn't have time to reinforce this issue, but one of the things I think that is different so far with this in favour of the current situation is that there doesn't seem to be outbreaks in hospital situations. And I think with SARS, that's what was happening, that they were getting infected people coming to the hospital, infecting the doctors, infecting the nurses, infecting the patients. And actually, um, don't quote me, but one of the reasons why this may have happened like that is because it was localized in hospitals in those zones and they could stop it more easily in that way. And one of the things that may be in favor here is that that situation um, doesn't seem to be happening. Whoops, where are we going here? Okay, um, yeah, so still it's quite high, the number of uh, healthcare workers, and we mentioned the Dr. Zhang, I think his name was, who died at the beginning. Okay, one, one of the other numbers for virus infections and pandemics they always bring out is the R0 or the R0 value, which is the basic reproduction number. So this basically means if the number is less than one, the disease will die out because you're, less people are infected by you than who have the disease, i.e. less than one. 
So if it's more than one, that means one person will affect more than one person, okay? So the seasonal flu has a very low, relatively R0, uh, which is 1.2. So that means every five people who have flu, will there'll be six more that will get infected, which is not great, but it's fine. But if you think of measles, it has an R0 of 12. So if you think about that one kid in a class of 30, that means 12 people. If you have three infected kids in a class of 30, more or less, they're all going to get sick. So that's pretty high. The current R0 of COVID-19 is estimated to be 2.28, and that's based on the Diamond Princess cruise ship data. So that's quite a good laboratory setting because you have a controlled environment where nothing gets in and nothing gets out, and you can see what happens. So that looks basically from here that it's going to be at least double the infectivity, let's say, of a standard flu. So that's already something important. Okay. Another factor is the doubling time. So this is um, how long does it take for the number of cases to double. So at the moment, the whole data set, including China, is 19 days. So if you take out China, it's five days, which is quite low. And the reason for the difference is that China already had the quarantine for some weeks and the numbers are going down. So actually, they skew the, the overall doubling time to much higher, okay? So that means when you look at the other numbers in another way, the mean incubation time is five to six days, which means if I infect, get infected today, what day is it today? Wednesday? Wednesday so Sunday, Monday, I'll probably start getting sick, more or less. But it could be longer, it could be two weeks, it could be less. Um, if I get sick on Sunday, usually I'll be sick for around two weeks, something like that. So that's why the 14-day quarantine is imposed, because that should cover both of those situations more or less. There will be extremes, of course, but you can't cover all of that. But that's one reason why 14 days. Quarantine, if anyone didn't know, comes from Quarenta, which is 40 days. That was the old ships in the black bubonic plague days. So 14 days might seem long, but it's better than 14. Okay, so here's the CFR stuff again. Um, so we mentioned this before, this is the case fatality rate. This tells you how lethal a virus is. So here's some context. Ebola has about 50%. In some outbreaks, it's been 90%. That's pretty, pretty high, not really good. Bubonic plague, obviously, is a guess, 60%, so on. SARS was already 10%, which is pretty high, and MERS was 35%. So that's very, very high still. Spanish influenza has been estimated to be about 10 to 20 percent and one third of the world's population was infected. So that's also very high and the numbers were big, but there's lots of other factors there for why so many people died as well, which we can discuss. Um, the normal seasonal influenza value is less than 0.1 percent. So if you're comparing, looking at the COVID data here, you can see different numbers from different peoples. The current global estimate from at least this report was 3.4 is moderately high considering it's a seasonal kind of virus. The US values were much higher and have gone down. Again, I mentioned this um, lag effect, which is basically between having cases and having a proper diagnostic kit available and then implementing things. So basically here, the number of cases is not so clear and then they get clear that there's more cases than they thought, so the number just drops kind of artifactually, something like that. Italy currently has a very high death rate. Not clear exactly why that is. It may be because it got into old people more easily somehow. It wasn't very checked, so maybe that's one of the reasons for that. South Korea, for example, has a very low CFR for, for the same disease. So we'll have to see how the data pans out, but for the moment, let's assume it's around 2 to 3% CF, CFR. But compared to influenza, that's quite high. So it's one of the myths that people say, oh, it's just like influenza, but it's not. It's more infectious and it's probably more lethal, okay? So here's some of the general CFR kind of data. So at the top, you can see Spanish influenza, which has an estimate, estimated 25 to 40 million people who died from the influenza. There's some reports that go up to 100 million people, which is extreme. Um, most of the that have come since then are very little. The standard flu is 400,000 per year, so that's quite low compared to this, obviously. I can't remember what the current death numbers were from, from the current outbreak. 
I didn't say. So here we had 2.3, so already a thousand. So it's still a long way to go to get to this level, but still, if the, if it's as high and everyone gets infected, then that's one of the things. Okay. Um, so diagnosis. <laughs> Obviously, clinically, you can be diagnosed, but you need to have a proper test because you might have a confounding disease, an infection, or something. So the current test is a nucleic acid amplification test, a NAT or NAT, depending how you want to say it. So this is an RT-PCR test, so it's an RNA test for a viral RNA, because we mentioned before it's an RNA genome, basically. That's one of the things. Um, so usually they have two primer pairs in some of the different genes, the specific genes I mentioned before, which are designed to be uh, discriminating between this coronavirus and other coronaviruses. There's also a control primer that is to related viruses as a, in case you have cross-reactivity, basically. So there is a WHO coronavirus technical guide for testing. If anyone wants to have a look at that, there is also the US kit that came out by the FDA uh, a week, couple of weeks ago. There was a few issues with this apparently because the negative control wasn't working properly, so they had inconclusive data. So that also was not helping the US situation at the time. As well, I think there was a lot of confusion about who can do testing, et cetera, et cetera, and that hasn't also helped, okay? So testing can also have other problems because um, are you doing it just on patients who got the symptoms? Are you screening for patients to look to isolate them? For example, the more testing you do, the more burden you have, you know, that kind of thing. You can miss a lot of people and so on. So that has a big impact too. There's, there will be a serology test at some stage, cross-reactivity, whether it's neutralizing and so on. Um, and I previously mentioned the biosafety stuff here. So it's BSL 2, 3, and there's obviously issues for transport of samples as well, okay? Um, and that's as far as I got, I could, didn't get it to get treatments. But basically, the take home message is more infectious than normal flu, about double the infectivity rate. The CFR, the, the case fatality rate, is also higher by at least tenfold, maybe up to 40 fold. So that's quite high, and it's even more so in old people. So one of the things I didn't mention about Spanish flu was that that killed young people, this killed old people. So the impact of Spanish flu was much bigger for that reason. The other thing to remember is Spanish flu was at a time when World War One was on, and also there was low antibiotics, maybe diagnostics was not good. So even though people traveled slower, it still got around the world, and there was also two peaks. There was an initial one, November, uh, December, and then another one after summer when winter came back again. So even though this is happening now, and we may go into quarantine, it may be fine, there will be concern after summertime that there is a second wave coming back. Um, the other thing that we don't know is how good your neutralizing antibodies are against this virus because there is coronavirus around every year in winter. Maybe you've already had one, but maybe those antibodies don't work. This is a new type as we saw on the tree. Maybe that's different types of binding, etc. So we cannot assume that pre-exposure to other coronaviruses is helping. So this means there's no herd immunity basically, which is probably another reason why they're concerned. Influenza, they don't block off cities, for example, for influenza. One of the reasons is there's antibodies, uh, sorry, vaccines, previous exposure, their death rate is low. Everybody knows that it's not too bad, let's say. Um, but in this case, I think one of the reasons for having this excessive response is twofold. One, unknown factors, but two, looks like it's worse than a normal flu from these early numbers. And three, social media probably doesn't help because like Australians, you know, you see one person buying all the toilet paper, you have to do the same. So that kind of thing is also, so it's kind of like a, virus going viral, so to speak. So that's um, where we are. Maybe next time we can talk about um, how this is stuff is regulated, like vaccines, for example, everyone keeps saying they're gonna bring out a vaccine in one year. How can you do that? Well, maybe next time we can say, how do you do that? And, and how does it work? Because there's a lot of concepts here. For example, imagine I had a vaccine for coronavirus and now there's an outbreak. What kind of clinical trial do I do to test that it works? Because the design can be a bit interesting. 
you can't always hope to get a big cruise ship full of people and go and vaccinate them in isolation. The same with Ebola, like how do you do those kind of vaccine trials and things? But we can do that next time, um, I think. So any questions? Quarantine, anyone? <laughs> Is anyone scared? A little bit? Sick of it already, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really Sorry? Really yeah. Yeah. No, I think the evidence is clearly it's worse than a flu. And I think as well, the, the consideration is that if it keeps getting bigger, the demand on the society is bigger. And we've already seen it doesn't take much and things start collapsing. So we will see. We will see. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.